Hello everyone and thank you for attending this awesome workshop. Today you're going to get some valuable information. I'm sure, similar to myself, many of you have to work, have to juggle, career, family, but you're also caregiving. And what you'll find on your seat there is a little information that's going to be valuable to you uh, beyond this workshop. Maybe you or someone you know uh, is employed and they're working really hard and they just feel alone out there. They're the only caregiver for their mother, father, maybe there's a disabled, especially need child, and they just need the assistance. Well, today I'm gonna to give you some great information, and so let's start. Enjoy the ride. Professionals seek to help caregivers deal with just their every day. They definitely understand the complexities faced by family care of caregivers, excuse me, they help to identify the things that are needed for the caregiver. They listen to the concerns and they acknowledge their feelings, which, you know, that's important. I know a lot of you feel like the heaviness is on you right now. And so I encourage you to seek professional help in the sense of there's a lot out there. And once again, your handouts that are on the seats there and that were given to you as you walked in, uh, you'll be able to get a lot of information. The caregiver role. Hillary once said, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a community to help someone when they're caregiving. Uh, there are two types of caregivers. The family caregiver, who's the relative, the partner, the friend, and they offer a broad range of assistance to an older person, to a family member, to a sibling. Then there's the care recipient, an adult with a chronic illness or disabling condition or an elderly person who needs ongoing assistance with just everyday little task. Okay, is everybody okay? Okay, we're gonna get started with the next part. Caregiving takes many forms. You know, you have your independent ones, the one <laughs> like my grandfather, I should say my grandmother didn't wanna give up the keys. Then you have those that really have a little mobility but still want to be independent. And then you have those that are totally free but they're doing little things and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, there's personal care like bathing, eating, dressing, and toileting uh, assistance. Then we have household care um, which is cooking and cleaning, maybe doing laundry for the person. There's health care that would be medica medication management physician's appointments, and anything dealing with medical conditions of the person that you're caregiving. And of course, just the emotional side. I think that's the most important thing, uh, companionship, activities, and conversation. So, caregiving requires a significant amount of time, and it's very likely to impact your family time, your personal time, and like me, <laughs> even your sleep. And I'll speak more about who I caregive. I've been a caregiver now for over 10 years to uh, my mother-in-law who is now deceased and also to uh, my grandmother now who's in a nursing home in another state. So I'll tell you about caregiving in, in another state. That's a whole nother topic. Uh, you may want to determine the amount of time to devote to your parents in caregiving. You need to make adjustments, you know, make a list. What will change in my life? What will change in the life of the family? Uh, you may have to reduce work hours, or you may have to schedule extended work hours for more days, or I should say less days. Uh, so you're working less days, but working more hours on those days. If your parents require full-time supervision, you may want to seek out adult daycare uh, provisions for them. And then you want to expect that all your energy will be spent on just making sure they're okay. But guess what? You have to make sure you're okay. So that means eating right, <laughs> drinking, a lot of water, uh, getting your exercise, you know, whatever your uh, religious uh, or spiritual uh, context is, understanding, uh, just having that me time for yourself and caregiving is very important as well. So let's just kind of start over and how caregiving takes place, especially in the senior and the elder community. Uh, there's a lot going on with uh, a lot of programs now for the elderly and so many people may live independently. Uh, most people refer, prefer to live in their homes like my grandmother, she wanted to live there. But uh, of course the neighborhood changed and uh, her health uh, kind of diminished a little bit so we had to move her into a nursing home. There's a retirement community. Um, there's something that sociologists and psychologists state that's important for uh, those, just everyone, just human beings. And that's touch, being a part of a community, being able to enjoy, if it's playing dominoes, cards, uh, just having conversation. 
And then there's residential care facilities where they're small group homes where people board. Okay, oh, sorry. sorry about the delay and the interruption. Uh, there is a lot of outside noise, so uh, just bear with me as we continue on. So prior to caregiving, there's uh, certain living conditions that an individual will uh, experience. They will live independently, once again, uh, where they live in their own home. Sometimes uh, resources of the community help them, like Meals on Wheels. Then we have the retirement community, where it's an independent retirement community, and everyone comes into a area of um, where they eat, you know, an eating place, a cafeteria, or something like that. Uh, then there's the residential care facility where it's a small group home where everybody lives. They may have their own rooms and it's a personal care home, but it's still a family oriented situation for the person. And then there's the assisted living facility where the person is able to get medicine, they're able to be seen by a nurse, but they're assisted and that's usually uh, a nursing home or a skilled facility within the nursing home. And then there's the immediate care facility, um, which is a round the clock opportunity where someone with dementia or maybe Alzheimer's, uh, they're able to receive that kind of care. So those are the places prior to caregiving or moving somebody in or you relocating and moving in with that person. Uh, other alternatives that are new, something called the Eden or Greenhouse Alternative is a program in certain nursing homes uh, around the country where the environment is more elderly centered and less institutionalized. So that it's enc they encourage independence and they encourage a uh, home-like interaction of plants and animals and children. So uh, it really keeps them going and keep them exposed, especially if they're in a nursing home facility or skilled facility and they don't get the uh, visits that they once got from relatives or friends. The next one is a veterans. We always hear about our veterans and that, um, you know, a lot of them are homeless. Well, there are veterans communities that are available uh, and provide multi-level care. And more of those are coming and uh, prayerfully more uh, monies will be allocated to more veteran programs for that. But in all of this, we deal with caregiver stress. And it's not a bad thing because you're only human. Caregivers experience extreme amounts of stress um, and the stress can take its toll. Common stressors are long distance caregiving, like myself. My mother lives in Virginia, my grandmother's in Louisiana, so I find myself having to go there uh, in between working and facilitating and uh, juggling clients. Um, a family or friend disagreement is also kind of hard for the caregiver. Uh, there's physical care needs, you have an uncertain future, you don't know what's going to happen. Maybe if you have financial uh, challenges, you don't know what's going to happen with your parent or with your situation, but you want to continue to give that good care. And it's always, once again, money, money, money. So the caregiver needs are respite, which are breaks. They need that. Uh, maintaining a life outside, which I was saying that if it, even if it's for a walk in the neighborhood, a jog, or just having coffee with a good friend, or just with yourself in a book, uh, caregivers need to know that their feelings count. That's important. They also need to say, I can't do it. If you can't do it or I need help, that's important as well. Their feelings are important and they have the right to ask questions and be listened to, especially if um, someone's caregiving for a parent and move the parent in the home. And so now there's maybe some challenges between a spouse, a husband and a wife, so to speak. Now, this is a scenario. We're going to work with this. So you live far away and you're working hard, just like myself. I'm a hardworking person. Uh, and I'm going to add this, you're a parent. Um, you have a great job situation, but guess what? You travel to see your mom or your dad, and you know this during the holidays that the refrigerator hadn't been cleaned out, uh, bills are unpaid, and things are in disarray. Maybe a neighbor has reported that your father has wandered the streets, and that's something you've never seen. Or maybe your mother was neglected, uh, or she's neglected her medical care. Maybe she's forgotten her diabetes medication. Well, these are all things to begin to consider if you're going to care give. And so if anybody has any questions or concerns or right now, we can discuss those and we'll move forward to the steps towards caregiving.
Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the steps towards caregiving. This is when you visited and things are just not right with your you know, mother, daughter, or whoever uh, that you may have to care give. You want to have open and honest discussions with family members, and it's essential that everybody's on the same page. Uh, and ask for help. Let's all say what we're going to do and how we're going to help. However, similar to my situation, uh, if people do not want to uh, or they're not concerned, it's okay. You know, they're just in a different time and space. Uh, don't fault them for that. But you do what you can do. You get those blessings. Um, another thing, you need to look at residential options prior to maybe moving somebody in. You need to know the type of care, what the finances are, and we'll be discussing about uh, estate planning and uh, those things that come along with that shortly. And you need to look at uh, each person and how they may transition, you know, how that move may affect them. And uh, if they are relocating to where you live, maybe a few visits in between, maybe some talks prior to, can definitely uh, assist that situation. Now the level of care needed, you want to evaluate, get a medical report to see what's happening, psychological report, mental awareness or assessment, just to see what's going on with your relative uh, or the person that is receiving, will be receiving the care. You want to uh, evaluate your own health and make sure that you're okay. Uh, and investigate what would be a long-term, uh, uh, you know, type of care for that person uh, if they were to move in. But your family dynamics are interesting. So you have kids, you have the dog, you have the neighbors, you have all your organizations and clubs, but you have to care give. So you just have to understand to prioritize and to be able to understand what's important, what's not important. Uh, and look at the living arrangements in your home. How many bedrooms do you have? Who will need to move out of the bedroom? Uh, can grandma, or grandpa, or whoever, auntie or uncle move into a bedroom with someone? Or do they need their own space? Those are also things that you will have to look at. And in all, it's a lifestyle change. And that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the food, the nutrition. If they're diabetic, they need low fat. Uh, you know, no or sugar-free items. You know, you have to make sure that they're getting insulin if they're on insulin or certain medications that they need. So, uh, but you also want to have them and allow them to enjoy themselves. So if you're dealing with a parent that has dementia or Alzheimer's, maybe it's great that they have hobbies or a game, something that they can read if they're still reading, um, maybe puzzles. You know, those are things that you can think about that will... Um, help you while you're caregiving or thinking about caregiving. Another thing is your home. Um, is your home physically equipped to be able to handle a wheelchair or a walker? Uh, will you have to move certain things? Will you have to lift carpet in your house? Uh, will you have to have hardwood floors? Those are things that you need to think about. Will you have to uh, build a ramp uh, as a wheelchair ramp and those possible changes? And would you have to purchase, if a person is wheelchair bound, would you have to purchase a van um, in order to be able to facilitate, you know, doctor's appointments and for them to uh, be able to maintain some mobility back and forth. So those are also important aspects of caregiving. And then, of course, as I stated before, the financial arrangements. You need to make sure you have all the banking statements, but we'll get into that shortly. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there with you. So is everybody kind of understanding? Okay, I see some heads shaking. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. Uh, we'll take a 10-minute break, and then uh, okay, we're back. So now we're, we've looked at everything. We've consulted with everybody in the family. And so now we want to manage the move, um, let's say, of the relative. If they're out of state or if they're in the same city or, uh, you know, in your rural country town or what have you. Um, so you need to be able to pack away the memories. If nothing else, you bring old pictures. You just don't want to throw everything in storage and allow them to be a part of that transitional period. Uh, in some communities, uh, there are organizations or companies that help organize seniors and help them relocate. Um, but the main thing is to keep some normalcy for all of them. And once again, everyone, I apologize for uh, the noise. <laughs> um, we have, uh, we're in our room, but we have several people outside the door making a lot of noise. So if your parent owns a rent, um, you also need to think about uh, maybe bringing in an attorney just to kind of see what's under, an understanding. Uh, when we get to estate planning, I'll discuss some of the things that I had to uh, deal with with my uh, mother-in-law as far as uh, when we relocated her from one city 
to another city. Now, the most important thing when we're dealing as a caregiver for someone that's a senior or elderly patient is medication and aging. Now, medication is a double-edged sword. Modern medicines have contributed to longer lifespans, improved health, and a good quality of life. However, for older adults and people with disabilities, medication, prescription, over-the-counter, social drugs, and alcohol, they may be remedies for a short time. However, they're a double-edged double, um, sword. I say this because when not used appropriately, effectively and safely, medications have devastating consequences. And this is what happened to my grandmother. Her doctor, and she never wanted to change. A lot of seniors do not like to change their doctors. So she would receive medication after medication after medication. And she always thought she needed to take all these pills. Well, she fell one day, and that scared her. And then she wasn't able to drive. And so it, we had to go in to assess what she could take, what she was being overly medicated. And that's a problem. So that's some of the things that you'll need to do is really look at their health, what's essential, what's not, what's causing certain side effects. Those are all important as far as being a caregiver. Research has shown that a high percentage of caregivers help their friends or relatives manage medications. Caregivers for people with Alzheimer's disease and other memory impairments commonly report problems with getting their relatives on medication at the right amount of time or getting the right type of medication for them. When patients, caregivers, and doctors and pharmacists function as a team, though, when everybody's on one page, then we can get the best medication and what's good and what's not for your elderly mother, father, uncle, or your aunt. And what I found is even as a younger person, a pharmacist, you can go in and ask a pharmacist. Even if you can't get to your doctor's office, your pharmacist is always there some 24 hours at Walgreens, and you can ask those questions and get a second and third opinion. Go to several because when memory begins to falter with the person, they may take the wrong medication and that can cause a, a terrible effect. Uh, they may have problems reading labels. Their vision may be impaired. Their hearing can be impaired. There may be difficulty with dexterity, their inability to open pill bottles or maybe mixing a pill. So those are all things. And then swallowing. Many people who are going through dementia and Alzheimer's have problems with swallowing. And then it's just the logistics of scheduling certain medications at what time of day and making sure that the medications are not mi uh, missed or the time is not missed for those medications. So does all that make sense? And okay, everybody understands that? Okay, well, we'll take another five minute break and then we'll come back and okay. uh, we'll, we're back. Up. Now, the one thing that we call medication related problems, if you see your loved one uh, they may have excessive drowsiness, uh, confusion, depression, delirium. Uh, they may have Parkinson-like symptoms where, you know, maybe their mobility, they're falling more. They can't walk on a cane, but they can walk on a walker. Um, they may have muscle, muscle weakness, uh, loss of appetite. Those are all things that may be attributed to uh, these prescription drugs that they've been taking. Now, uh, one of my favorite things is estate planning. A lot of people don't like to talk about estate planning, but estate planning is very important. Even as a young person at 20, um, my grandmother is in a nursing home, and there's a young gentleman that was in a motorcycle accident, and he was a mere 28 years old. And so, uh, as I have stated to many before, that estate planning is important. You want to know who's going to handle the money. Uh, do they have any property? Um, what's happening with bank accounts? Uh, do they own real estate? You know, um, is there a medical directive? Is there a power of attorney uh, for financial directives as, so, as well as medical directives? Uh, is there a medical release where you can access all the information? Uh, how do you handle retirement assets if they work somewhere for 20 or 30 years and want to transfer any annuities? How does that work if you want to put them in a nursing home like we had to do my mother-in-law? We had to get an estate attorney, which uh, that was the only way to be able to, by law, uh, Texas law, to be able to uh, get her assets in line uh, regardless of how much uh, retirement she was getting. We definitely had to get that. So she had a lot of assets, uh, she had annuities, and so we had to uh, obtain legal information, and that was important. So it may be something that you have to do. And then you have to look at long-term care insurance. You know, do they have that? 
um, maybe they didn't work, maybe they have limited income where after a while uh, you may need long-term insurance to supplement a nursing home stay. Uh, maybe Medicare, Medicaid, or what have you may not, you know, carry, or um, you may not be able to uh, have full access to a nursing home facility because you're limited on resources. So those are all things under the estate planning. So financial arrangements are very important uh, while you're thinking about getting towards that caregiving uh, position. You need to get with all the siblings, um, you know, and just say, hey, we know we need to just be on one page. Uh, there needs to be a will, a living will. We need to have a medical directive. We need to have a do not resuscitate. Does mom want to be resuscitated or dad? Should something happen to them? Those are all important aspects of caregiving. And these need to be open discussions with all the siblings and everybody in the household. Um, but the last thing I want to discuss, as I've given you a lot of information, and once again, I have a lot of information in your packets, is senior care scams. And this really makes me mad <laughs> when uh, I see seniors being scammed. Um, and, you know, they're just nice and just love everybody and the world is just great. But you have people that will scam seniors. The FBI reports that senior citizens are attractive to con artists for a number of reasons, even if they are based on stereotypes. They look at the rich seniors, most likely the demographic of their home. So if someone lives in a, you know, exclusive neighborhood, they may prey on them. Then they look at the polite person. You know, they grew up in the 30s and the 40s, leave it to Beaver, and those are nice little things, and it's just a wonderful world, and nobody does anything. And then they look at the forgetful senior. You know, maybe somebody that, hey, he's the milk guy, or hey, he's the postal worker, or at least he's dressed like a cop, but he may not be a cop. And so I'm going to go through these scams. The common scam that targets some seniors is Medicare and health insurance scam. Every U.S. citizen and, or permanent resident over 65 qualifies for Medicare. Well, unfortunately, in these type of scams, perpetrators may pose as Medicare representatives to get older people to give them personal information, or they will provide bogus services so that they can make uh, makeshift mobile clinics or use their personal information to uh, build Medicare on their behalf. And the next thing you know, your loved one has, um, doesn't have those resources available to them. The next one, number two, is counterfeit prescription drugs. Most commonly, counterfeit drug scams, and you hear about it with the opioids now, um, you can get them all over the internet. So if your senior has access to the internet and they want to get cheaper drugs and they're ordering out of Canada, or the next door neighbor says his cousin has a pharmacy in the house, um, that can also be a problem. So those are things that caregivers need to definitely look at. The danger is that besides paying money for something and their medical condition, the victims may purchase unsafe substances, which is unfortunate. Okay, I'm gonna give you all another break and then we're gonna continue on with uh, the scams. I thank okay. you. So I know some of you are just, by the questions you had earlier, are like thinking, you know, man, my loved one could have been scammed, yeah? Well, we all can be scammed, but you know, seniors are not the only ones, so just always be smart. And these days, identity theft and crimes and hacking and all that is uh, quite prevalent, so just be aware. The next scam, it's funeral and cemetery scams. Yeah, funeral and cemeteries. The FBI warns about two types of funeral and cemetery fraud perpetrated on seniors. And one approach, scammers read obituaries and call or attend the funeral service of a complete stranger to take advantage of a grieving widow or widower, claiming that they had the deceased outstanding debt and that they need to get some money to settle the debts from these relatives. So that's some of the scams they get. Another tactic of disruptable Funeral homes is to capitalize on family members who un are unfamiliar with their services. So in one scam, a funeral director could easily insist that this casket is better than that casket. Usually it's more expensive, which you don't need it. Um, or they may not even give you the opportunity. Uh, I have relatives now, they just want to be cremated. Uh, they tell me, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So, you know, it's okay. They're more concerned about their loved ones that are left here and things being able to be taken care of. So those are a few of the funeral home and cemetery scams. Now there's fraudulent anti-aging products. So everybody wants to stay young, maintain, look young, but of course, you know, we're all getting old and we're gonna age. 
And so there are many people who will say, here's a uh, skincare cream or something that's being bogusly sold on the market that's going to make you lose wrinkles or be uh, younger, which is not true. As a matter of fact, uh, Arizona had a case where there was fake Botox uh, and some people were convicted in 2006 of a big crime where they were selling bogus homeopathic remedies which would make you young. And so those are also um, scams uh, that caregivers need to look out for. And we have uh, our next understanding or next scam would be telemarketing phone scams. And I'm sure you all get that or robocall or something like that. Well, just think, uh, caregivers need, even if you're caregiving and your loved one does not have dementia or Alzheimer's, it's important to know what phone scams. I mean, someone, uh, I received a call from the IRS. Uh, stating that I owed and that if I didn't pay, they were going to do this, take me to court and all this stuff. Of course, the IRS will tell you that they do not uh, call. They'll send notices in the mail, certified letters. So that's how they act. And so maybe you might want to be careful of telemarketers or tell your loved one. Um, with no face-to-face -face interaction, no paper trail, these scams are incredibly hard to trace. Also, once a successful deal has been made, the buyer's name is then shared with these scammers. And so it's like a black market underground thing. You know, names and social security numbers and dates of birth and all of that are shared. And that becomes a problem for a caregiver who is caregiving. The pigeon drop. Now, this is a con artist that tells the individual that he or she has a large sum of money waiting. You hear this now as catfish. Uh, it's a new thing that they're doing. Um, but they'll split the money with the person if in good faith they can withdraw a certain amount of money from their bank account. And often these people will pose as bankers, lawyers, or maybe a trustworthy stranger, even a family friend. So you have to always be careful of those. Then you have the fake accident ploy. A con artist gets the victim to wire or send money that someone, I think Nigeria or Africa had this, where someone is sick or someone needs to get out of Africa. And so that's another one that, you know, a senior may fall for. You know, I know these are crazy, but yeah, that happens. And then, of course, there's the charity scams. You know, we see the kids on TV, the ones that are in Africa, or we see the dogs and, you know, we have a heart for them. And unfortunately, some of them are solicited and some of them are fake, especially if they're door to door. Uh, and this occurs a lot of times in natural disasters where someone knocks on the door and uh, they want to do something to your home or help your cat or do something and just want to get in and be able to access information. So that's another scam. And then, of course, there's email phishing scams where a senior receives a certain email that appears to be from a legitimate company and they ask to please update their information or please verify, which in essence, the senior receives the email maybe from the IRS or from the tax year, from property taxes or something, but it's all fake. So you have to really be careful of that one as well, uh, especially internet. Internet and hacking goes hand in hand. And then we have the investment schemes. I'm sure all of you have seen your wonderful actors or actresses talking about um, the reverse mortgage schemes. <laughs> you know, it's really great to get a reverse mortgage. And these scams are prevalent. So. Uh, what they do, they take advantage of the fact that many people at a certain age own their home and it's a valuable asset that increases the potential dollar with a certain scam. Now, a particularly elaborate property scam in San Diego saw Foster sending personalized letters to different properties. The letter made to look like it was official was displaying only public information. So it showed the property's value, the homeowner, or um, how much it would be reassessed if they get a reverse mortgage. Closely related, this is a potential for a person to be scammed. Scammers can take advantage of older adults who have recently unlocked equity in their homes. So really think about everything, the finances, the health, the medical, the prescriptions. Um, and then you have the sweepstakes and the lottery scams. Yeah, yeah, everybody wants to get rich quick. And uh, there's not an easy way to do it. This simple scam is one that a uh, person is familiar. It capitalizes on free lunch, maybe, 
the scammers inform their mark that they won a lottery and they have to pay a certain amount of money and then they have access to your account or something. And during this time, the criminals will quickly collect the money uh, and the fees, clean you out, and then you're found with nothing. And then you have something called the grandparent scam. The grandparent scam is so simple and so devious because it's one older adult relying, uh, most reliable asset to their hearts. So they, they pull at the heartstrings of these people. The scammers will place a call to an older person and they'll say something like, hi, grandma, do you know who this is? And when the unsuspecting grandparent guesses the name of the grandchild, the scammer now has the grandchild's name and then they can establish a fake identity. So this is the grandparent. And then once they get the fake name, then they're able to say, hey, send me some money through Western Union or MoneyGram. And, you know, so these are all crazy type of scams. So in conclusion, what have we learned today? That there's a lot to caregiving, but there's a lot of rewards to caregiving as well. Despite the challenges, many adult children find that providing support and care for their parents is one of the most rewarding and experiences, uh, rewarding experiences they have ever heard. Parents can contribute to family through sharing their past experience and making them an integral part of the household. Grandchildren have a unique opportunity to learn and absorb family history. Caregiving carries its extraordinary opportunity to give back once the parent has provided for us. We all want to do that. We want to give back. I enjoy giving back to my grandmother who uh, lives in another state and my mother-in-law, she's passed on now, but I enjoyed helping her as well. She lived in another city. So, and my mother lives in another state. So caregiving is definitely uh, something that has affected me. But the rewards of caregiving is this. It's an opportunity to create positive memories. It's an opportunity to improve relationships and a chance to heal the past. You know, we always say if something happened to them, oh, I wish they were here, I wish I could say this or that. Uh, you've learned to put someone else first and it's made you a better person. You're patient, you learn how to listen, which I've, I, I've done that. <laughs> and you're grateful by the chance to pay your parents back for caring for you and sacrificing for you as you were growing and coming up. Um, it increases your compassion and tolerance. It definitely does. You really have to be patient. Uh, the experience of loving and caring um, is great. You know, you feel good. You feel like you have no regrets. You have a peace of mind. You have closure. So if someone passed, you know, you gave it your all. You have spiritual fulfillment. And as I said, if you have to sit somewhere uh, with your Bible, your, you know, whatever your religious uh, background is, and just have that me time, that's important. You're a role model for the next generation, so your kids begin to see how to treat you, and their kids will be able to see how to treat them. My parent is my best friend, still alive for me, and appreciates the way I honor her. Um, it changes your priorities, so you might not go see that movie on Saturday night. You may spend time with your loved one watching a movie with them on a Saturday night. And best of all, it's the satisfaction of the fulfillment of a job well done. So I just want to thank you all for coming here today. And um, if there's any questions, you have my contact information. I really appreciate it. And um, just caregive and learn as much as you can and be the best caregiver you can be. Thank you.